Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back into our Father's Word. How to study prophecy. Again, just real briefly, uh, in a recap, our Father makes it very simple, and He wants it kept that way. As a matter of fact, when Christ would say concerning His return, When you see that that happened to Noah where they're giving and taking in marriage, that's exactly how it's going to be when I return. This type of prophecy is using history itself to let you know it's going to happen again. And as it is written in the great book of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, there's nothing new under the sun. That that has been shall be again. That that goes around shall come around. So our Father repeats things over and over. Some people go through their entire life creating the same mistakes that our ancestors made uh, 3,000 years ago. It seems they can never learn. It's better to learn mistakes from our Father's Word because this is a process of God proving His children. How quick do you learn from others' mistakes? Or would you prefer to make them all on your own? That's up to you. But basically, that's what prophecy is about, is taking history and simplifying it to the point that all you have to do is look, that same thing is going to happen again. That's one of the types of prophecy. Now, we had prophesied, or through Isaiah, God prophesied that uh, when Israel, the house of Israel, came against the house of Judah in confederacy with the, the nation Syria, They were going to overcome, and God told them, don't worry about it. I'm going to give you a sign. And he told of the child that would be born, and that child would be Emmanuel, God with us, as a sign. And now, uh, as we go into today's portion of this, you're going to find that there was also a near historical fact there that Isaiah himself would have a, a son. Let's get with it, and the... King of Assyria is being worked into this, and he is a type. Isaiah 14 declares that the Assyrian is the type of Lucifer or false messiah that will come in the end end days. That's where you come in, and that's where you want to be very careful. Okay, a word of wisdom from our Father. We ask it in Yeshua's name, chapter 7, verse 23. Let's pick it up there again and go with it. And it shall come to pass in that day, that's the day that the Assyrian comes, that every place shall be where there were a thousand vines and a thousand silverlands, it shall even be for briars and thorns. In other words, the rent or the lease of one vine was uh, one shekel or one silverland, if you choose. And... um, he said, when, when there used to be a very productive producing uh, vineyard, all you're going to have is briars and thorns. 24, with arrows and with bows shall men come thither, because all the land shall become briars and thorns. In other words, it'll be a hunting patch for rabbits probably, okay? Be that as it may. That's yet future? Well, in a sense it is, because no, something that was once fruitful and stops bearing fruit, when you remove God's Word from an area, certainly that's what it turns into. No fruit. 25. And on all hills that shall be digged with the mattocks, there shall not come thither the fear of briars and thorns, but it shall be for the sending forth of oxen and for the treading of lesser cattle. In other words, they're going to trample what's left down even of that. That leaves you about zilch, about nothing. And spiritually, when the king of Assyria comes, that's what it will amount to. Now, we're in the middle of the prophecy. All these things were given for a reason. And that's what we're here for today, 
is to show you how to study and discern the prophecy. Chapter 8, verse 1, and it reads, Moreover, the Lord said unto me, Take thee a great roll. That, that means, uh, today we'll call it a real thick writing tablet. And write in it with a man's pen concerning Mehershal Alhazbaz, the longest name in the Bible. But uh, first I want to back up. What does it mean uh, to uh, write in it with a man's pen? It means um, in the Hebrew that you will put it in common language that's used by the common man, not some priest language, not some aristocrat's language. But I want you to write it so that the common man can understand it. That's the way God speaks. He does not wish that his teachers teach on a level that the vocabulary is out of the reach of the ear of the least of the hearers. It's called true wisdom is to simplify for the majority that that might have been difficult from the manuscripts. What God is saying here, keep it simple. Keep it down. Communicate. And that's what prophecy is. Never in your mind allow yourself to think that's a very complicated prophecy. Because just relax and meditate on it. Let the Spirit touch you because all prophecy is very simple. Example, uh, here is the name. What does this name mean? And Meher Shal al husbaz means um, haste, spoil, speed, and prey. And there's a prophecy within that concerning the Assyrian. Haste to the spoil and speed to the prey. In other words, they're going to clean your plow. That's what the name means. Longest name in God's word. Verse 2. And I took unto me faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest, Zechariah the son of Jeberachiah. Verse 3. And I went unto the prophetess. Note, uh, this, uh, this young lady was a prophetess also. And she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, Call his name Mehershal al Hazbaz. In other words, uh, the haste, spoil, uh, speed, and pray, which we've covered. Verse 4 For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus, and the spoil of Samaria, being the ten tribes, the house of Israel, shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. Now, again, there's a great deal of prophecy within that. We will not have time to go into it in this particular teaching. But from the book of study of the book of Isaiah, you will receive it, that the king of Assyria is likened unto Satan in Isaiah chapter 14. And did God say, name this child Emmanuel? No. Why? Well, Emmanuel means God with us. And when a child is born of a natural conception, that's not going to be God with us, with the exception of a visitation of the Holy Spirit when we call upon him at times. But literally and factually, Emmanuel, that one that would come, was truly in the flesh, God with us. All right? So it's important. By now, I hope you've sharpened up that the names are very important. As a matter of fact, the prophecy that I want you to pick up on hinges on these names. As a matter of fact, the attack itself would be 20 months, 21 months from the time of the prophecy and it would be 12 months from the birth of this child, okay? Verse 5. The Lord spake also unto, uh, unto me again, saying, 6. For as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh, that's to say the waters of peace, the waters that run from the fountain, um, even near the fountain of the virgin. In other words, 
they would refuse Emmanuel, no doubt. They would rather not have that gentle water that goes softly and rejoice and rejoice in resin and Rimelah's son. In other words, uh, they wouldn't accept the real prince. That is to say, the house of Israel and Syria. Seven. Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. And he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. He's going to flood them literally. And of course, the ultimate in this prophecy you will read in Revelation chapter 12, where this same type, king of Assyria, king of Babylon, Satan, tries to destroy the woman of which the house of Israel and the house of Judah consist of, symbolizing Mother Israel um, of the peoples, as well as those that are uh, spiritual Israel, those that believe upon Emmanuel. Satan will be attempting to flood them, to rise up and flood, and he'll do a real good job of it. Only the election, those that know the difference between the true Christ and the false Christ will escape. Verse 8, And he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck. That's, that's the weak spot in man. That's the kill point. And the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breath of thy land, O Emmanuel. Why would he do this, O oh, Emmanuel? In prophecy, when that name is mentioned, of course, it could be translated, In thy land, O God, with us. But he wants to draw attention back to Shiloh, the Prince of Peace. He mentions that name again that is yet future to this time, but was indeed born to woman about 650 to 75 years after this point, that this child also would um, uh, come to walk this earth named Emmanuel. Verse 9, Associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces. That's a warning. And give ear, all ye of far countries, Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Now, let me tell you something. Gird yourself with what? Well, many Christians say, well, the gospel. Put the word of God as my gird. Well, if you, put, use, if you have on the gospel armor, and you're held together by the word of God, how familiar are you with it? Well, I just believe. Believe what? Have you studied the word? Because, you see, the Assyrian and his attack was a terrible thing when it happened. And what God is telling you, it's going to happen again exactly this same way. Are you wise enough to pick up on it and see that you're not deceived in relationship with Emmanuel? Now let's continue. Verse 10. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. You plan any way you want to to avert my plan. It will come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. Now, is that not strange? Pick up on it. Don't let it slide by you. What does Emmanuel mean? God is with us. Why wasn't it translated Emmanuel as it was back in verse 8? Because the prophecy is that those that stay in the path, God is with them. Well, what difference does that make? It means that they, that is the only escape from the own rushing of the Assyrian, our spurious Messiah. Verse 11. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me. This is not just a weak little uh, spur of the moment instruction. Yakar, it is strong, a warning that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, verse 12, 
Say ye not a confederacy. Do you know what an overall confederacy is? You should. It's one worldism, the new world order. And to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy, neither fear ye their uh, fear, nor be afraid. In other words, it's written. It's going to come to pass. It is part of God's plan. You don't have to worry about it. That does not mean that every Christian should not vote to, to what they know is right, absolutely right. But to go out and try to start an organization to defeat the plan of God, um, you would be in trouble because you would be on the side that should be in fear. Verse 13, sanctify the Lord of hosts himself. Listen to me. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear, your reverence, uh, your one that you focus upon. And let him be your dread. In other words, if you get on the opposite side of him, you have something to dread. Verse 14, listen carefully. And he shall be for a sanctuary. Do you know what a sanctuary is? It's a place of safety. He shall be for a sanctuary. Do you ever need a place of safety? But for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin, that means a trap, and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In other words, if you're not careful, and this is talking about Emmanuel, this is talking about Messiah, that if you do not understand God's word, if you do not understand the confederacy or the one world order, then if you're not very careful, when the, uh, the prophecy being, when the Assyrian army comes, it, which will be what? It will be Lucifer of Isaiah 14 uh, in the appearance of Christ himself claiming to be Christ with all his little angelic beings performing supernatural miracles on earth in the sight of men, and those that call themselves Christ man, that is to say Christ, this is how Christ becomes the stumbling block, Christian, will worship this false one if they're not girded with the word of God. If they've only, well, I'm a believer. Believing in what? Are you familiar with prophecy? Do you know how to study prophecy? Otherwise, it could be deception. Verse 15. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. They're going to be deceived. And quite frankly, if you don't know at this time and point in history in this generation of the fig tree, the difference between the false Messiah and the true Messiah and the chronological order in which they appear, you're in trouble, friend. I don't care what you think you believe because God's Word, through the teachings of Emmanuel, Matthew 24, which we just completed, stipulates clearly and simply in common man's language that the false Messiah comes first and if you're not careful, your Christianity can become a stumbling block because you'll worship the wrong Messiah. That's what it's talking about. 16, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. Do you remember Revelation chapter 19, verse 6, whereby it stated that the testimony of Jesus Christ, was, the, the Spirit of Christ, was, the, was prophecy? That's what should be sealed. The very words of Emmanuel. 17, and I will wait upon the Lord. Don't get in a hurry. Don't jump to the false one. Wait for the true one that hideth his face from the house of Jacob. That means both houses. And I will look for him. Where do I look for him? In his word to be well informed because God does not pull surprises on anyone. Now really sharpen up for me. Verse 18, behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel 
from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. That's the prophecy. Did you get it? What children? Well, the children he gave and gave the specific names for. That's the sign. And it had better be with you always. Who was the first child? Well, the first child happens to be Shur, uh, Shear Jazab. And that was back in chapter 7, verse 3. What does it mean? The remnant shall return. You can count on it. That's a sign. As a matter of fact, the remnant in part returned inasmuch as the Assyrian went over Judah also. And the house of Judah returned. And that began the sign in the year of our Lord, 1948. What was the next name? Emmanuel, God with us, that a virgin would conceive and a child would be born and he would be the true Messiah. And then, what about the other child? Meher shall al husbands That you can count on it. The confederacy shall come into being in a one world system. In the Assyrian, which is the type of Antichrist, shall come first, and he will make great haste, the, the, be, a translation of the name, he will make great haste to the spoil. What does that mean? That means anything he can spoil, he will. If he can make you accept him as Messiah, then you're his speedy prey. That's what the boy's name means, and it is as a sign and that Emmanuel could even be a stumbling block as stipulated in verse 14. I don't know, how are you fixed? How plain, I mean, that is placed from our Father in such a language concerning the children that they are signs that no one should miss it, for it is in common language. Very common. And I don't know how many will be deceived. That remains to be seen. Verse 19. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep, and that mutter, should not a people seek or ask unto their God for the living to the dead? Hey, we've got so many far out things in the name of religion today. We've got everything from hee-haw in the church, instead of on the stage at the Grand Ole Opry, we've got, we've got every kind of religion you can think of that is so foreign to the Word of God, strictly traditionalism, that people would never know. That's peeping at familiar spirits, and there are plenty of them around. Invite them into your house. They'll come gladly. They'll even play religion with you. They'll even play church with you. If it is not written in God's Word, then it is not God's Word. So seek God through His Word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and stop playing religion. Verse 20, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this Word, it is because there is no light in them. He, ha, who, who, and all kinds of other religions. Have you found it? No. God is not the author of confusion, but of truth. If it isn't in this word, it's not the word of God. Learn how to study the word and prophecy. 21. And they shall pass through it hardly bestead. That means a hard case lot and hungry, and it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. Why does God let these things happen? Uh, you know, you hear it all the time. Why does God let the little children go hungry? Don't blame God. Blame their dumb parents. A parent, when he takes on the responsibility of bringing a child into the world, takes on the responsibility to feed the child. So don't blame God for their ignorance. The responsibility of motherhood and fatherhood is treated as a game in this generation. And people say, why does God let this happen? God doesn't. We do. 
those that are supposed to have the responsibility. God gives every warning on parenthood and, so, and, and otherwise in His Word. It is written. The big question is, have you read it? Verse 22. And they shall look up, up to, unto the earth, and behold trouble, and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. You see... When you start dealing in that that is traditions and you begin to look to it, there's only one place you're going. You're not going to find that true, close, real walk with our Father, which means at the same time you receive blessings and gifts, gifts which give you the ability to strive in His force that brings this word and truth around the globe. That is common sense. He said, keep it down for a common man, utilize common sense. Write it that way, explain it that way, teach it that way. And not only that, but he gives us the gifts and the ability to be able to do that. So the choice is man's. The choice of man's is either... Either you um, follow our Father and do it His way, or you're going to be a hard case. I don't know how He could make it any plainer. You're going to be a hard time case, and you're going to go from dark to darker. And what that uh, means, and uh, figuratively, is that the deeper you drift into darkness, the nearer you go to the familiar spirits, which means Satan's very best, his own. All right? And um, now, what, did, what do we mean then about this child? We're going to turn real quickly to Matthew chapter 1 in closing this particular part. Matthew chapter 1. Did this come to pass? Was it, it was prophecy at the time it was given? Now, that's past history. It was called the first advent. Uh, St. Matthew, first chapter, verse 21, and it reads, And she, this is referring to Mary, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Uh, that is to say, Yahweh's Savior. For he shall save his people from their sins. That is to say, upon repentance. That was God's purpose. And this is the fulfillment of one of those children as a sign. 22. Now all this was done. Why? What? All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, verse 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So there you have it, my friend. The first from the book of Isaiah, prophecy. God speaking and giving that sign. The children are for a sign. I don't know. Then it was prophecy for that time and it became history. When that babe was born. And of course, now that should strengthen your faith to know it happened exactly as God said it would. Now, we could go much deeper in this. We could follow him through. Well, how do you know that Christ was supposed to be uh, crucified? I mean, after all, it was God with us because it was written that he had to be crucified. You read it as he quoted from the very cross itself. Eli, Eli, lama shabbatane. Which is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Not that our Father forsook him, but he was teaching, he was quoting the 22nd Psalm. Even down 
The 22nd Psalm even goes as far as to let you know the Roman soldiers would gamble for his clothing at the feet of, foot of the cross. Nothing by accident, my friend. This child was a sign. Did you get all there was to glean from it? If not, be very careful, my friend. And I speak of the word overall concerning that son because it can be a stumbling block, a very severe one. We'll complete how to study prophecy in the next lecture. Don't miss it. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered and the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the Mark of the Beast. All right, bless your hearts there. We are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. And if the spirit moves and you have a question, share it. Please understand, we're in over a considerably 100 million homes around the world, and there's no way that we can answer all questions, but... If uh, when we take that handful of yours is there, then that's the way we learn. And please remember at the same time, we go on new stations every week. We have brand new students. So if it would seem that some of the questions are repetitive, then that's what you're in the business of, my friend, is teaching the tender ears. And when you become an old salt in, in the study, then you have to be patient with the little ones, those that are just coming in. So don't ever be caught in the situation where you're a know-it-all. Well, I knew that. Why would he answer that question? You didn't when you began. And we have, that's what we're in the business of, is working in our Father's field to draw in those that seek the truth. So be patient. Just Put it in low gear and know that we have to plow slowly but deep. All right? Now, those of you that listen by shortwave, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. You got a prayer request? He's your father, and he loves you very much. He really does, especially when you let him know you love him in return. That's why he blesses those that love him, that follow him. He owns everything. And he, it makes his day to be able to bless his children. Talk to him. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, touch, prosper, heal in Yahshua's precious name. Amen. Okay, let's see what kind of questions we got. Oh, I, I remember. Didn't have time for this one as we closed the last. Larry from Florida. Do your views on capital punishment relate to Christ's new commandment to love our enemies? Absolutely. Absolutely. You see, God loves them too. That's why he makes it very clear that if a man premeditate taking the life of another, that he wants him sent immediately back to the Father so he can love him or try to put him back into position where he can what does that entail? Execution. Well, I didn't know execution could be an act of love. Well, it certainly is. Well, how can that be? Well, um, if, if, for example, some idiot were going to break into a home and take a 12-year-old girl out and kill her, then 
it would be an act of love to the girl if someone had executed him before the fact because he was guilty enough before the fact to suffer the death penalty. It would have never happened. That's love, is to love our children enough to protect them from, from evil, wicked, cruel people that try to force themselves on other people. The way you do is you knock them off of you. That's love. You love your children, you correct them. You love your enemies, you correct them. It may take a two before or it may take a 357. But you love them enough that you correct them and try to make a man out of them, all right? Otherwise, hey, love them enough to send them to the Father. Jesus himself would say in Matthew chapter 5, you have heard, you know, concerning the law. He said, I didn't, I didn't change the law, not one jot. That means the smallest little tittle, the sound of a letter. Iota in the Greek. Not one iota of the law. Because it still remains. You have heard it said, thou shalt not kill. The word kill in English kind of, you know, you could kill a fly. But this word is phonyons in the Greek. This is the prime. It means criminal homicide. What Christ said was, ye have heard that you shall not commit a criminal homicide because you're in danger of judgment. Why? You could be executed. That law has not changed. And that's loving our people. And yes, it's even loving the poor, miserable soul of the murderer because he needs to be sent to the Father so the Father can straighten him out in the presence of the one he murdered, and he might even find salvation through it. Or he might burn in hell. That's to say the lake of fire. I don't know. That's up to our Father. Yep, that's real love, is to love your people enough to protect them from evil people. Okay, Melody from, doesn't know, say where Melanie is from. Please explain 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 through 18. My sister thinks this is talking about the rapture. Well, the poor soul, I know a lot of people think that, dear. But have her back up to the 13th verse because that's where the subject and the object that's being discussed is put into play. And it's talking about where the dead are. And what it's saying is, if you, as a Christian, believe that Christ rose from the dead and went to the Father, then surely you believe that those that are in Christ are with Him also. Not out here in a hole in the ground, but are with Him. He said, don't, I don't want you to be ignorant like the heathen are. And then he goes into these verses at the last trump, the seventh trump. You see, the Antichrist appears in the sixth trump. And that's where he's going to get the people that think this is rapture. Because they think that, um, that the seventh trump is going to happen some way or another before the sixth because they've listened to scholars. I don't know what kind of scholars you would call them, but six always comes before seven. Now, to meet them in the air, the word air, as it is in the manuscripts, the Greek manuscripts is our, which is to say breath of life, meaning the spiritual body, to be changed instantly. Have, have dear little sister read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Okay, Mabel from Kentucky, Revelation 6-2. Is this the Antichrist riding his, the white horse? Absolutely it is. And this is what's going to deceive many people. It simply means that he looks like Christ. He claims to be Christ. He even has a bow, which is a copy, supposedly, of the bow having been mentioned in the fourth chapter around the throne of God. But this is a cheap fabric imitation. Toxin in the Greek. Uh, Antoinette, thank you for your teaching, and I enjoy the flowers every day. Well, we, we have a wonderful flower lady, and, and it's just holly all the way as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and um, flowers that uh, pick up the spirits of everyone, and I just love her to pieces. Uh, but she's a little flower lady. Okay, Linda from Florida. 
what are your thoughts about a Christian going through the legal system to collect a debt? Well, what is common sense? Common sense, and first the Word of God says, if someone owes you a debt, hey, you go to them and you say, hey, you owe me bucks and I need that and I loaned it to you in good faith, so forth, so forth. And if he says, out, or the check's in the mail, you know, well, if it's not, then you take an arbitrator with you, a witness, and have him try to arbitrate it. If that can't be worked out, then he's not a Christian, sue the heck out of him, okay? That's real simple, just sue him. Right is right, and that's the law of the land, and it's the biblical law as well. Well, where is that written? Common sense. Um, Margaret from Tennessee. Uh, we might say, well, where it says that you should never take your brother into court. Well, he's not your brother. He's not even a Christian, or he'd pay his bills, all right? Mar I mean, face reality and use a little common sense. Margaret from Tennessee, who did, uh, Linda, I wasn't talking to you, I was talking about some of these people the way, I, you know, I, I get these little things a little later and I'm just kind of beating them to the punch today. Margaret from Tennessee, who did Christ come through, Solomon or Nathan? He came through Nathan, he did not come through Solomon. Your documentation on that, you will find it in Luke chapter 3, because Luke chapter 3 is the genealogy of Mary. The genealogy that is listed in Matthew chapter 1 is that of Joseph, who was not the father of Christ. All right? Almighty God was. Naomi from Canada. Hmm, um, what would I do? What would I do without you? Well, well, thank you for that comment. I'm, I thought that was part of the, I'm, I'm Naomi from Canada, and my question is, in the parable of the ten virgins, will the door be shut to Gentiles forever? No, 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 no. No, we still have the millennium, and everyone that has not had an opportunity to hear the truth will be taught there. Well, there's churches all over the land, yeah, but my dear, God's Word's not taught there. They teach salvation, baptism, and then let the sheep starve. They never get into the meat of God's Word, whereby they can find that peace of mind that is so rich. Some of them do, yes, but in the majority, what is being taught is you join this church or you're going to hell. You're going to fry like a piece of bacon. You're going to be doom and gloom if you don't join us. And you divorce people get way in the back. Don't you even dare try to come up to the front. I mean, they put you in bondage. Don't you dare try to take communion in this building unless you sign on the dotted line right here, you know, according to Deacon Jones right here, you know. Well, what did Jesus Christ say about it? Well, that, I'm just making my point here and making, winning friends and influencing people at the same time, you know. But Christianity sets you free. And there are a lot of people that have never had an opportunity to study the Word of God, and their God will not let them blot them out of the Book of Life until they have been taught and Satan is released and test them a short time. Why? We have a loving God. We sure do. B.J. from New Jersey, in Luke 16, how can you explain this fire was spiritual and not literal? Well. Because it's a parable, it's not an actual thing, all right? And how would he already be in the fire when Judgment Day hasn't been, hasn't been held yet? God's not going to put anybody in fire until after they've been judged. And the Great White Throne Judgment doesn't take place until the end of the millennium. I mean, Christ was teaching, and he was teaching through using a parable about two actual men that lived. And the fire is embarrassment, shame, and degradation that he could not approach Almighty God. Uh, Marcia from Florida. I'm a Christian, and my husband choose, chooses not to follow God. What should I do about this? Well, um, 
read 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I cannot advise you without knowing all facts. So a wise man would never do that, all right? But read 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Who knows, uh, he, you might set an example that would bring him to the Father. You know, you, you're the one that has to judge. That, you see, there would be so many things. Is she abused? Does he beat her? Uh, there would be so many things that would change the advice that would be given by God's law, okay? And you can't give that law without all the facts. So read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and it'll pretty well lay it out for you, okay? Lillian from California. What is your views on a church that has open communion that anyone can take and whether they are a member of, the church, of that church? Well, hey, that, that's a church after my own heart. It isn't, a man is never worthy. That isn't the question. The question is, do you believe Christ was worthy, meaning innocent, to pay for our sins? It's like someone waiting to be baptized when they're perfect. They, no one would ever be baptized. You repent, you're perfect for that moment, and it helps you when you call upon him to help you in your weaknesses, all right? That's, I think it's wonderful. No man and no church has the authority to tell an individual whether or whether or not they can take Holy Communion, the sacrament, that was paid for by the blood of Christ on the cross for all his people. It is a dangerous thing for a man to set himself in a position and forbid anyone from taking that. I would hate to stand before God and say, well, that old boy, God, you know him, you know, I know he's going to hell, and I wouldn't let him take your communion because I knew you didn't pay it for a sinner. Us good deacons know that. Well, I'd hate to be in that good deacon's shoes, all right? All right, just winning, winning friends and influencing people again. I'm just making all kinds of points today, but beloved, it's true. No one. Don't, when we take communion here on, on television even and you join us, if you believe that Christ was the Son of God, and was worthy. You take communion with us. Don't you let anyone forbid you. Uh, Michael from Virginia. I would like for you to explain this verse to me. Genesis chapter 25, verse 23. And the Lord said unto the two nations, are, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. It was Jacob and Esau. And he was talking to Sarah, and that's the way it was. Uh, there are two nations, the two superpowers of this end time. Only one is not so much of a superpower, but it's getting back there. All right? Wait till the elections in June. I'm not talking about our election. I'm not in a position where I can talk about our elections in this nation. I'm talking about Russia. Okay, Roger from North Carolina. You said that, you state that God's word says that Satan is the only one condemned to death and then state the 7,000 angels will die also. He's the only one named, all right, by name. And those are almost non-entities in as much as they refuse to be born to woman also and, um, and they cook their own goose as it is written in um, Jude, the first six verses. So, yep, they're condemned. I would have thought you'd have known that. Okay, Helen from New York. I have searched and asked, still don't know or understand, Revelation 2.13, Satan's seat, and Anthropos, faithful martyr, slaying when, where Satan dwelleth. Well, it's prophecy, my dear, and it's written in those letters to the church. Satan's seat is where? Well, here on earth, you'll find it written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, where he sits in the seat of God, claiming to be God. So it's Jerusalem. And what is, who is Anthropos that was faithful to the true father? What does Anthropos mean when you say it? Antapata. 
which is to say anti-father. It's those that are anti against that first father. Now, Elijah told you, or God told you that Elijah would return and turn the children's hearts to the fathers, plural. And when you know who this fake father is, you had better be against him at his seat, that is to say, when you're delivered up before him in Jerusalem. I hope that helps you understand. Um, it could even be referring to one of the two witnesses in as much as he's called a mortar, for two will die in that pata, arena, street, if you prefer. Chris from California, please explain where this is located in the Bible and what it means. Take up your cross and follow me. Thank you. Uh, you'll find it in Luke chapter 14 for one place. And what does it mean? What did you pick a cross up for to be crucified on? In other words, be willing to die for me if you want to follow me. Okay? Who knows? You may be one of the two witnesses and you would have to die for him and the rest of us, all right, uh, when you were delivered up. So it means to be very serious in following him. He picked his cross up for us, all right? Uh, Olya Shola from California, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Since we are made in God's image, does God have a wife? And what kind of language will we be speaking in heaven? Well, God didn't, doesn't have a wife. He divorced her, all right? You'll find that in, in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8. He divorced her. And why? And she is always playing around on him. And, um, of course, that's why Christ, in being crucified, when he died, then she can remarry in biblical law. And he might have take that wife back. Now, does God have a wife? He has a remnant, all right? And, of course, we're speaking spiritually. The language that will be spoken in heaven will be that spoken on Pentecost Day that is the language placed there by God through the Holy Spirit that every ear hears and understands. No such thing is unknown. Uh, Bob from Illinois. Do you teach that God's elect stood against Satan in the first earth age and as a result are they being rewarded with priesthood and salvation today? Well, more like hard work and and teaching God's word and uh, planting seeds and being ridiculed, if you want to call that, you know, they were, salvation is justification. And you will find in Romans chapter 8, beginning with about verse 26, that the remnant doesn't even know what to pray for. But God intercedes in their life because they were predestined. That they were justified and not found wanting, which means before the foundation of this earth age. Not the first earth age, but this earth age. So, yeah, God's elect stood against Satan in the first uh, rebellion, when Satan rebelled. Therefore, God can intercede in their lives and cause them to do what he wants to, and then they can't cry like little babies on Judgment Day and say, yes, Father, but... I would have been okay if you hadn't have interfered in my life. So God will not interfere in someone's life that has free will. That is to say, did not overcome there and are in the proving stage at this time. God will not touch their lives unless they ask him for his help. Then he will. Uh, Pat from Wisconsin, a TV minister and his wife read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, and he said that the word falling away meant departure or rapture. I checked my companion Bible and my concordance, and we all know it means apostasy. But that's, that's one of my students. That makes me so proud. But he said it means departure or rapture. Where do they get their information to fool the people? Ignorance. Dear one, they're, they're, this is traditions of men, and that's what's been taught. They'll even go so far as to say in verse 7, where it says, Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. They'll call, they'll call that he the Holy Spirit. 
when it's total ignorance because the verb is transitive and must transfer the identity back to the person that's being discussed in the subject in the Greek back to verse 4 and 6. And they just stick stuff in. They're playing Russian roulette with God's Word rather than being scholars themselves. When any student that has the tools to check out the Greek or the Hebrew or the Chaldee can spot their shortcomings. I'm so proud of you. I thank you for that. Um, there is much deception in this world today. And unfortunately, our people just love it. As Paul would say, they swallow it hook, line, and sinker. They love it. They love to be deceived. And I'm quoting from 2 Corinthians chapter 11 where Paul says, hey, I'm worried about all of you because I want to present you to Christ as a chaste virgin, not as Eve who was seduced, expatio in the Greek, wholly seduced by the devil. And he said, and it's no marvel. You get some super preacher comes along and you swallow it hook, line, and sinker and you enjoy it. He said, don't marvel for Satan himself comes um, transformed in the English. It's, it's disguised in the Greek as an angel of light when he's none other than the devil himself playing Jesus. It's all written. We must always catch on to that. I'm so proud of all of you that you study and do show yourselves approved. I'm out of time again. We'll pick this up in the next lecture. I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. It completes your life. It shows you the way. It tells you how to be happy and how to have peace of mind. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, hey, you help us keep coming to you once you do that. But this is most important, that you stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day. Do you know why? because Yeshua, Jesus Christ, is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. You have been viewing the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you are interested in obtaining more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer includes the Mark of the Beast audio tape, a newsletter with a written Bible study, a complete audio tape catalog, and a list of reference materials available through Shepherd's Chapel. You may request our free introductory offer by telephone. Call 1-800-643-4645, 24 hours a day to request the offer. You may also request by writing Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. That's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us and serious Bible students around the world for our next in-depth Bible study, Monday through Friday at the same time. Thank you for watching and God bless you.